Welcome to Econ Talk from the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University. We'd love to hear from you if you have any comments or feedback on this podcast. Please send me an email at Roberts, my last name, R-O-B-E-R-T-S, Roberts at G-M-U dot E-D-U. I'm talking today with Mike Lunger, an economist at Duke University. And Mike, you know, we both have been teaching economics for a while, and people like to complain that economics is just common sense. It's so intuitive. And yet when we get in the classroom, we sometimes find it's a little less intuitive than we might have thought. Has that been your experience as well? It has been my experience. I asked the question of my students when I was teaching at uh, Dartmouth College in the economics department back in the mid-'80s. And the fact that so many of them got it wrong prompted me to ask some of my colleagues, some of whom were economists and some who some were not. And it turns out that their answers to that question were really different from what I expected. And then on talking to them more, it really did seem like the economic way of reasoning was more different than uh, than I expected. Let me let me tell you the the story, and then we'll talk a little bit about what I think the answer is. The premise was that suppose you really wanted to go to a concert, and let's say now that it was a, a group called uh, Greenway, and you're really excited about the, the Greenway concert, and your girlfriend really wants to go too. So uh, just to make sure you get tickets, you show up the night before and camp out, and then as the sun comes up, you realize that there's a whole bunch of people ahead of you in line, that the concert was more popular than you'd expected, you really hope that you get tickets and you wait in line for three hours and the the line snakes along towards the window and you're a couple hundred people away and the the ticket window slams down and you realize you're not going to get tickets because it's sold out horrors well you've you've been there all night so you're, you're pretty upset you start to walk along towards home but then you realize that there's a secondary market and there's scalpers selling tickets And so you think, well, okay, maybe I can still get tickets. And I may have to pay a little more, but but that's fine. And you get over there across the street, and there's a crowd around the people that are trying to resell these tickets for the sold-out concert. And you hear that they're asking $300 a ticket. And even worse than that, you actually see people buying tickets for $300. So the, 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 the price of this, this is not just what's being asked, but actual transactions are taking place at $300. And you start to thinking about it, and you think, I really want to go to the concert, and my girlfriend really wants to go, but man, $300 a ticket, that's $600 for the two of us, and you start to think about, and this is the concept that I wanted to illustrate with the question, you start thinking about opportunity cost, and the opportunity cost is whatever you give up the next highest valued use for any resource that you spend. So in this case, when you spend the $600, you're giving up all those things that the $600 could purchase. And just for example, what that means is um, you could buy 10 Greenway CDs. You could get an MP3 player or you could get a nice stereo and quite a bit of money to go and uh, dance with your girlfriend. So there, there's a whole lot that this is worth for one two-hour concert. So the, the premise of my question uh, back then Are they was, good in concert, by the way, Greenway? <laughs> I, I've never seen them. Have you seen them? I, I, I have not. You've uh, heard of them, though. Yeah, if they existed, they yeah, don't. Be, but it, if, if if Greenway were actually a group, I'm sure the concert they'd be, would be phenomenal. Fantastic. Well, they, people people are paying three hundred bucks. Yep, sure. they're, they're, so I'm I'm willing to believe that this is a really excellent concert. It's just that 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 six hundred dollar cost is too much. Reasonable. A lot of people would balk at, at having to shell out the six hundred bucks. So now, having decided that it's not worth that six hundred dollars, I'm. In my story, I'm walking along towards home, and my head's down. I'm sad, but because my head's down, I notice this scuffed-up envelope that most people might not notice because their head wouldn't be down. Lucky then, you. <laughs> well, I pick up the envelope almost kind of absent-mindedly, and I look at it, and it, it's been run over a couple of times. There's no writing on it. I open up the envelope, and inside it are two Greenway concert tickets. And I feel pretty bad about this. I look around and I think, you know, somebody probably lost these tickets. They would be really upset. So I wait a while and I satisfy my own sense of moral compunction. Mm -hmm. Nobody's coming back for the tickets. They're mine. Excellent. Now, the question is, what happens next? What do you do? 
And I thought that what By the I way, did, Mike, I got to interrupt. Only an economist would ask, what do you do, right? I mean, most people <laughs> would say, this is awesome. Call I the girlfriend. The fact that I even thought it was a question <laughs> means that I'm an economist and probably not really, uh, that means I often stand alone at parties. I think the word is normal that you're looking for. <laughs> Well, to me, it seemed like, remember that in my defense, this was a question that I asked in the microeconomics midterm. Okay. And so in terms of the context, I expected the students to get it. And by the way, Russ, I'm a really first-rate teacher. I thought, boy, what a great teacher I am. And I told them about this concept of opportunity cost. I defined it, and I think all of them were able to define it just word for word perfect. Mm. So it wasn't that they didn't understand the definition of opportunity cost. So you thought, yeah. No, it turns out I'm a really bad teacher. <laughs> so there's a difference between being able to recite the definition and understand it, as it yeah. turns out. Because all of them said, free tickets, I go to the concert. And what's the, uh, what's the economist's uh, answer? Well, someone trained in economics or someone who thinks in terms of opportunity cost in economics is going to say, well, you saw these tickets being transacted at $300 each. And it was given that you didn't think it was worth $600 for you and your main squeeze to go to the concert. But if that's true, then finding the two tickets is a whole lot finding an envelope with $600 in it. And since you had the $600 before and didn't spend it, why would you think that you would spend it now? Because you could, with the tickets, instead of using them, you could go sell them to one of those folks on the street. All you have, right? to, do is, all you have to do is walk back and you saw actual transactions taking place. And so um, what do people say on the exam? More than half of them said, free tickets, I would go to the concert. Suggesting that people either didn't understand it or potentially maybe behave a little differently than we think they do. I think the answer is that many of them didn't see that coming, and they were so excited about being able to go to the concert that they, they didn't pay much attention. What surprised me was that afterwards, when I asked some people about it, faculty or uh, just people that I've talked to on the street, as you can tell, I don't have much of a life. I have conversations with, <laughs> with say, about things like this with people on the street. Um, when I asked them, would you go to the concert, they say yes, and then I explain why they shouldn't. They say, well, that's just wrong. People don't think that way. So even after I explain what I think is the correct answer, they say that's wrong. So I, I think you're right. As a description of behavior, then, what I think is obvious in terms of economics doesn't seem to describe what human beings do very well. Well, then let's look at a richer example, maybe, or a different variation on it, I should say. I, the real question is, is this a fluke? It, 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 it appears to be, from an economist's perspective, an irrational response. And it, there are ways of salvaging this story from an economist's perspective that, that let's ignore income effects and other things. But basically the idea is pretty simple. You had a chance to pay 600 bucks for the tickets. You didn't when you saw the scalper. When you have the tickets in your hand, it's still going to cost you 600 bucks, and you don't, you don't resell them. You, you go to the concert, most people would answer. Yeah, so, so – when I had the 600 in my bank account, I didn't go to the concert. When I had the 600 in my hand, I went to the concert. So in both cases, it costs 600. In one case, I go to the concert, and the other that I, I, in the other case, I don't. It sounds like a contradiction. An economist might call this irrational, uh, an, ex an ignoring of the true costs and benefits that somehow people are acting differently in these two situations when there's really nothing fundamentally different. So, so here's the question. Well, is it possible that people behave differently in that situation than economists might expect simply because it is a somewhat alien situation to be in? Most of us are not scalpers. We're not used to transacting in that market. We might be uncomfortable. Uh, we might be worried that we really wouldn't get 600 bucks. We might be afraid we'd get, ar we'd get arrested. So how much of that do you think is uh, an explanation of what's really going on? Well, I've thought about this quite a bit, whether it's just an artificial situation or something we're not very used to. And one explanation that I've thought of is the difference between the way economists think about costs and the way accountants think about costs. So in, in one case, you're spending $600 out of your pocket, and to an accountant, that looks like it's costing you $600. You find the ticket, and you go to the concert, it doesn't cost you anything. 
because there's in an accounting sense, you're not writing a check. But there's no out-of-pocket. Yeah, and so I actually think people think about this, uh, th- think in that way fairly often. Um, I had a friend who owned a beach house, and he owned the beach house for a little while, and the assessed value of the beach house was a million dollars. Now, the houses at the beach have appreciated quite a bit in the last 20 years, so it was it was a nice house, and it was right on the beach, but it wasn't fantastic. A million dollars seemed like an awful lot. He didn't use it very much. And I said, it's costing you a lot of money. He says, no, no, we own it free and clear. <laughs> right. It was left to me. I said, well, if you take the million dollars and invested it at just 6%, that's $5,000 a month. It's costing you $5,000 a month to have that house. And he said, no, mine goes to eleven. He said, no, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't hear me the first time. I own it. It's mine. Yep. And, yeah. I own the house. It doesn't cost me anything. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is the way most people think. They think although, like accountants. Although, let's go back to the ticket story for a minute. Let's suppose I'm on my way with $600 in my hand to go buy uh, two iPods, one for uh, myself and my uh, and my wife, or in your story for your, for the, the, the ticket, the Greenway lover and, and his girlfriend. Uh-huh. So this person's got $600 in cash. He's about to go buy uh, this uh, these two iPods, and he sees... Uh, that he can actually, uh, he's not going to get the, the the tickets like he'd hoped, but he could spend the six hundred dollars on on those iPods as he had planned. In that case, we understand he'd probably not scalp buy the scalp tickets. He'd go on and buy the six hundred dollars worth of of the iPods. Would it be any different if he found the tickets in that situation en route to make that six hundred dollar purchase, so that the opportunity cost of going to the concert was more vivid? Is there any possibility that might change the way that person behaves? I would say from an economist perspective, no, and from a reality perspective, almost certainly. Or another way to think of it is you've got $600 in your pocket. You're on your way to buy the iPods. You're tempted by the scalping opportunity. You pass it up, and then you realize you lost the $600. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, but you (laughs) found these two tickets. Would you then use them, or would you run and scalp them and go buy the iPods? And presumably, you'd go buy the iPods. Yeah, I mean, an economist would say that that would just be it's it's a wealth effect, and the only difference was before you had six hundred dollars. Now you have something that's worth six hundred dollars. There's a little bit of transactions cost to go sell it, but there shouldn't have been any difference. Probably, though, um, I'm now convinced after talking to people, uh, in the, I'd lose the money. I'd be mad I didn't have the iPods, but I'd go to the concert. Yeah, it's interesting. I- you know, some people think economics is called the dismal science because we're always reminding people of the fact that there's no free lunch, that there's an opportunity cost. And we have a lovely series of essays essays by David Levy and Sandra Pert on our website, econlive.org, that talks about the true origins of the phrase. But let's talk about the, uh, the sort of received uh, wisdom that it's because we're always depressing people with these kind of opportunity cost arguments. And it kind of reminds me, this is going to seem like a, a radical segue, but, but let's give it a shot. It, re- it reminds me of when, when you give somebody a gift. Think about the, how strange this is. You know, as economists, we often say that when you give somebody a, a gift, uh, let's say you're going to somebody's house for dinner and uh, you bring them a, a, a bottle of wine and you go spend $20 on it. Uh-huh. It'd be much better in some measure of economics. I think this is the, the thin, crummy version, but let's – a straw man version of economics – be much better to come to their house and give them a twenty dollar bill, uh-huh. according to one definition of rationality. There's, there's just no question that they'd be better. They could buy the same bottle of wine or anything else they wanted that they presumably could value more yep. than the value than the value of the bottle. At, and the at, bottle at of wine. worst, they're just the same off. So, a, a thoughtful guest brings a twenty. And now, one answer is yeah, but then you never know get it's, invited back to that house. Well, yeah, and why is that? Not. You know, you should be embraced. You can say, what a swell guest that Michael Munger is. He brought me a $20 bill instead of a lousy bottle of wine. Now, one explanation, which I don't find very very um, effective for this, is that, well, when you buy the bottle of wine, the person doesn't know how much you spent. Whereas when you give them the 20 they've got the cash, and they know exactly what you spent. Whereas, you know, I don't really find that compelling because people have a pretty good idea how much bottles of wine cost. And So here, here's the question. Why is that? What's wrong with bringing a 20? Why do we cringe at a guest who would do such a thing? We would. We'd be horrified. Oh, yeah. They, they, 
very Go. well. I, I would tell people at work about what a bad guest that person had been. Right. So why is that? There's an ancient distinction, I think, first and most importantly made by Aristotle between value and use and value and exchange. And something that you make as an artisan or something that you make for the specific purpose of using it or having someone else use it is just better. He claimed it was morally better. Did you say Aristotle? Aristotle. That's pretty highbrow for these podcasts. I don't know if we can handle that. Go ahead. And uh, the, 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 what he's comparing that to is value in exchange. And he, he agreed that things that we make to exchange had value, but it's a morally, it's a much lower kind of value. So bringing the Aristotelian example to now, suppose that I wanted to impress someone. I, maybe I wanted to have my girlfriend over. If I were to make her a home-cooked meal, and it wasn't maybe even all that good a meal, then she'd be much happier with the effort that I'd put into it than an even more expensive catered meal that I'd right. had brought in. Yeah. So I think Aristotle was saying something about human nature, when the, the difference between value and use and value and exchange. The thing is, markets tend to make us focus on the value and exchange. Value and exchange dominates. Well, let, let me get back to the gift idea. Uh, is it not strange that if I'm going to buy you a gift, let's let's go back to the um, I'm 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 a guest at your house. We, we've agreed that the twenty dollars. If you is, come to my house, a twenty would be fine. By the way, well, or how about two twenties? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, let's say I come to your house and I, because I'm a good guest, I bring you a, uh, a a bottle of wine, or let's say I bring you a present. It's your birthday, uh -huh. and I buy you a book uh, that I thought you would find interesting. And as I give it to you, you confess, "Oh, great! I was going to buy this for myself, and now you've saved me the trouble." Isn't it interesting that that's a bad gift? Because uh -huh. that's like cash. That's yeah. all I've done. I've saved you the transaction cost of actually purchasing it. But how strange is it that the ideal gift is a gift you would not have bought for yourself? It has to be something I would not buy for myself. Which by definition means it's a gift that you didn't value at the cost of the gift. Given that I have enough money to buy it and would have chosen not to. Right. It's a, a bit ironic. To me, it, it suggests some sort of... Um, well, the only way I can understand that as an economist is that is the following. You have something you really like, but it's not worth the money to you. Uh -huh. I buy it for you. So you get a free bit of satisfaction from this thing that it's a surprise bit of satisfaction because you weren't you'd already ruled it out. Uh -huh. And now you get to enjoy it. So presumably that's part of the reason why that gift is is so thrilling is explicitly because you would not have bought it for yourself. But it does raise the puzzle of why you wouldn't be more happy with money. Money that you would not then spend on that gift. You would spend on something else. And yet there's something – don't we kind of like those gifts where we, we realize, yeah, it's not worth it. Oh, I wish I could have it anyway. Just well, a strange thing. I, th I think most economists would explain that in the same way we might explain efficiency wages for labor. It, it It's a little bit of something extra. It, it's what – game theorists think of as a, as a costly signal, it matters to me that you cared enough to waste money on me. Whereas if you bought me something useful, now you're, you're married, Russ, yes. so suppose that for your wife's birthday you bought her a new vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. Now let's suppose it's a really, really nice new vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. It's still a cold night at the Roberts house. I, well, no, what I should have gotten her was season tickets to the, uh, to the Nationals. Well, the, it, it, it has to be wasteful. <laughs> That's even more wasteful. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, just kidding. No, you're right. It has to be a somewhat. It has to be an extravagance, and be, because that means that you're think you yourself are thinking of it as a gift rather than as some sort of compensation or bribe or incentive. But it's strange that the uh, the ideal gift isn't just the cash. Wouldn't that be more extra? Wouldn't that be a more pleasant extravagance? It's not. Uh, we understand it. I, I, one one way to to think about it maybe is the. Um, it, or the memories associated with a physical object that can't be associated with cash. So when I bring you the uh, the um, the book that you've you've always wanted, when you hold it in your hand, uh, you know it's the book that I brought you, and you have some maybe sentimental association with this uh, marvelous evening. On the other hand, why couldn't you just take the cash and buy the gift and say, "Yeah, that's the 
gift I bought with the money that my guest gave Yeah, me. because otherwise you're saying, suppose we take the opposite of your previous example, and you give me the book, and I say, you know, I would never have bought that for myself. Right. It's not nearly worth that much money to me. Right. Sometimes this, this strategy totally backfires, right? Yeah. yeah. I buy you the, uh, the, uh, collected, uh, the collected MTV spots of, of Greenway. Uh-huh. Uh, and you hate them. It turns out, but you uh-huh. now have every DVD they've ever uh, put on uh, put on uh, on DVD, and, and it was pretty expensive. And right, it's it's glaringly embarrassing. In fact, you'd love to sell it on eBay, but you're afraid when I come over the next time, I'll say, "Where's that great DVD <laughs> co- compilation I got for you?" And you've got to be able to brandish it. Uh-huh. It's kind of tough. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on to a different question. Uh, that, that, that your your example brings up. Oh, actually, though, before we do, you shared this story with some of your colleagues, if I remember. And yeah, I, I, I tried it on some political scientists. And you used an analogy with uh, basketball tickets. Can you tell us that story? Well, um, several times I asked my colleagues in political science departments or psychology departments, and they would just say, well, people don't think this way. That, that's the, the wrong way to to argue. People value things differently than the market does. And so I thought, well, maybe that's right, but that just means that they're mistaken. There's all sorts of mistakes people make. They believe in space aliens and and all sorts of things that are wrong. We used to use leeches um, as part of medicine. Hey, don't be be insensitive to leeches. They're they're actually making a comeback. I hadn't thought uh, that engaging in leechism would be a problem. No, it could be. Some of our listeners would be offended by that. (laughs) Um, But... I also noticed that I'm a department chair, and I have been for quite a while, and I have to decide on raises every year. And um, one of the things that people who have been at Duke for a while, because I teach at Duke University, um, if they've been at Duke for a while, there's a decent chance that they have season tickets to the Duke men's basketball team. And the, the men play in Cameron Indoor Stadium, which is a kind of tiny little place. It holds 8,000, and it's a, a, a temple of uh, of college basketball, Dick Vitale says that it's the best place to watch a basketball game in the United States. That's because he's just sucking up to. Uh, <laughs> he's trying to Kishowski. get tickets. Yeah, no, that's all. That is it. Don't 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 put any stock in that. I don't get to go. I don't get to go. I don't have season tickets, so okay. I'm kind of envious. I'd like to go sometimes, and some of my colleagues have season tickets, and I've seen uh, tickets, and right on the right on the front of the ticket, it has a face value, and it says forty dollars, dollar sign four zero. So in some sense, that's the price of the ticket. So when it comes around to raise time, um, some of my faculty will say, you know, I really need a big raise. And I think back to the time that they went to a basketball game, and this year when Duke played UNC, I saw tickets scalped on eBay and elsewhere for $2,500. That's $2,500 for one ticket. So if you have two tickets, that's $5,000 you paid to go see that basketball game. So I point this out to the faculty member who's pleading poverty. I got no money. Well, you must be pretty rich if you can spend $5,000 to go to a basketball game that was on TV, for heaven's sakes. Mm. And But they say, no, no, look, here's the ticket. It says $40. So I realize that I'm no match for them, <laughs> and I pull out $50. Look, I'll pay you the $40 plus another 10 And even the people that don't believe in opportunity cost have still never sold me a ticket under those circumstances. Yeah, it is a strange phenomenon. I I, um, I like to think as a, as a pretty hardcore uh, believer in economics as, and the economic way of thinking is that is that people are just not accustomed to that activity of scalping. But I, I do admit that there may be more to it than that. It's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, without that puzzle, I mean, without the economics, we have a tough time uh, explaining it other than to say that people will not resell stuff they already have, but of course they will. There are people who do sell those beach homes uh, after a while. They do sell those. T- they do scalp those tickets. Well, I, I ask people, if you found a diamond on the ground, would you give it to me for a dollar? <laughs> and they probably would go and have it appraised. Now, they might or might not sell it. But if they were to sell it, they would sell it for its market price. They recognize that its market price is its value. So it, if, the, if the diamond had a tiny $40 printed on it, it wouldn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. The price you bought for something has almost nothing to do with its value. Now, in a, 
market setting, by and large, those two things are going to be the same because yeah, people, people have un- anticipated future changes in price. And they've un- they understand it after a while that, that, for example, when you move from St. Louis to Washington, D.C., as I did two and a half years ago, and you sell your house and you go look for a new one and you find that the house that you sold is now – of equal, the equal the house of equal quality is about twice what you sold your house for in St. Louis, and it's about ten times what the owner paid for it. You don't go to the owner and say, you know, you're really mean. How could you sell that house for ten times what you paid for it? I'm not going to pay that. That's outrageous. I think you're right. The houses almost go the other way. We're used to thinking of houses as commodities whose values change, but um, tickets or things that we got just in the short term. Um, we're less likely to think of reselling, although eBay is changing that. Yeah, I think a lot true. of people just routinely think about selling their possessions. Yeah, it could be eBay's greatest contribution to human welfare is an increased understanding of economics. It makes it makes opportunity cost concrete because yeah, at any true. given moment, something that I have in my hand, I could, with fairly low transactions cost, convert it into cash. Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting point. I think that's very true. I think that has changed the way people behave about some of their um, – the things that they uh, hold rather than the things they purchase out of pocket. Well, and I think people who are with Aristotle and think that value and use, the intrinsic natural value of something, are going to object to it and think that eBay is ruining us. I, as an economist, think that value and exchange is a pretty good measure of value and of the relative scarcity of resources, so I'm a fan. Yeah, me too. Well, we got a couple minutes left. Let's ask. Uh, let's go off the beaten track here. Let, let's talk about why it is that uh, Duke University sells those tickets for 40 bucks uh, to those season ticket holders and why uh, groups uh, like Green Way or, or their real-world counterparts, Green Day, uh-huh. why when they uh, hold concerts they don't charge the market-clearing price. Have you thought about that? I think about it a lot. And my the, for, for Duke University, I think the reason is because the, the, the tickets for students are free, and I'm putting that in quotation marks. You may have seen on television the way that Duke rations uh, student tickets is in a tent village called Krzyzewskiville. And what they're looking for is to make sure that only the most fanatical fans are those who get into the, to the into the games. So what I've suggested, and it takes three weeks sometimes, outside in a tent in January. North Carolina is not that cold, but it's not an easy way to live. I've suggested we just put a big candle by the door, and whoever can hold their hand in the candle flame the longest... <laughs> We'll get tickets. So that that's a measure of intensity right there, and it takes a lot less than three weeks. So far, they haven't taken me up on that. I think generally for the tickets that are sold to season ticket holders and concert tickets, people don't want to seem like they're the ones who are ripping people off. And we don't have many opportunities for price discrimination where we can charge people who want the ticket the most the highest price, although we do some because tickets down on the floor are more expensive and tickets up high are cheaper. So there there is some price discrimination going on. It may be that we just can't judge very well in advance. And a lot of times it's true that people who buy tickets in anticipation of scalping them get left holding the ticket and sold for less than its face value. That's correct. So what they're doing is probably transferring risk. Yeah, that's part of it, but it's hard to sustain that explanation in the case of Duke basketball or or the Barbara Streisand uh, con- once in a you know her last concert, which I, I guess she, it's coming up again. Together. Yeah, well, her last concert is coming up again. Uh-huh. Evidently, I, she, she she had her. It's like it's like the Roger Clemens retirement tour. Uh-huh. You, know, you collect all the presents, and uh-huh. then you retire, and then you come back out of retirement, collect another round of presents. <laughs> uh, there's probably some limit to how many times you can do it, but uh, we haven't reached it yet. <laughs> But I th- in the case of Barbara Streisand, I think in her last tour, her, the face value was getting up there for some of the tickets. So I think it's interesting. I think there's been some movement toward toward market clearing prices and tickets, but clearly not not fully. And I think part of it is what you mentioned. I think it's the desire one to sell out and two to sell out the arena to the most fanatic fans because that affects the outcome. Presumably. But they have a re- they do have a hard time controlling the secondary market of scalpers in mm-hmm. many cases because. I can go stand in line. And I think one way they try to get around it is put a limit on the number of tickets you can purchase. Yeah, that's true. So I can't buy 100. I can only buy four. And, and fortunately for Duke, uh, Duke students aren't that bright. Uh, <laughs> I went to the University of North Carolina, and I, so I know this is a fact. And, and they know that they'll just ignore opportunity costs, keep them, won't resell them, and they just get those lunatics out in the court. <laughs> I hope you guys do better next year, by the way. I'm uh... I'm, I'm a Carolina fan myself, so I, <laughs> I, I can't argue too much. 
Mike, it's been a delight talking to you, and uh, may you have much success at concerts and basketball games down the road. Well, thanks very much. I'm going to try to get some of those tickets. It was great talking to you. Bye-bye.